Um, the first thing I want to talk about uh, today is what we've come to call persistent low-grade misery. And you can pick whatever uh, margin metric you want. We're using the MPP uh, calculation metric because it's, it's out there and it's got math behind it and it's got some universality to it. And what's remarkable about this to me is that um, $8 has been the insurance threshold, right? That's where you start getting coverage, and $4 is the disaster coverage threshold in this MPP regime. And if you look at it, we haven't really had what I would call disastrous MPP margin numbers, right? If you just look at this chart and say, how are people doing? $8 is okay, according to the system. You say, well, you know, we're not doing terrible. And if you looked at it and said, when's the last time milk production was actually down in the United States? And we want to take a shot at that. When was the last month and year that milk production in the United States was actually lower than the year prior? December 2013. So even though we've had this persistent low-grade misery, which, you know, depending on how you want to measure, uh, it's at least four years, and we're heading into the fifth year of not-so-great margins, not out-of-the-park margins by any stretch, we're still at a place where we're producing more milk. So that says that somebody is making enough money somewhere to make milk. And when we think about this, I don't know if it's in the context of consolidation, but one of the things that I believe is tremendously underestimated is the impact that the ethanol revolution had on the Midwest dairy industry. And while some people say, well, was it, was, it must have been bad because we had high corn prices. And I would say, absolutely not. Ethanol was the best thing that happened to the Wisconsin dairy farmer in a long, 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 long time. And this chart helps explain why. Because the orange line in this chart shows the cost to, grow, to buy corn, and the green line shows the cost to grow corn. And you can see that big mismatch, right? And so when we had 20, Pete showed those years, right? He said they called them the glory years. When we had those years, we had $20, $22, $23 milk prices. We had $7 corn. Wisconsin dairy producers didn't spend, on average, $7 for their corn. They spent something closer to 4 And so we had a really good period here in the Midwest around that time. And what's happened since then? Well, ethanol is kind of dead, right? We've outproduced the blend wall. Um, you know, we still make ethanol, and it's still growing at a small rate. But ethanol is no longer the monster that ate the corn crop, right? We've, we've, we've sort of fed that beast, and it's a lot calmer now. And so in the post-ethanol era, what do we have? What's, what's the corn price today? 380 this morning, right? And so if you look at it, we have not had very much $18 milk when there's been less than $4 corn. So the blue circle there uh, represents 2018, I believe. And you can see, that so, the, so across the bottom of the axis, you have the uh, class three price for milk across the x-axis. See, I'm, I'm not an economist. It's the y-axis. Um, across the y-axis, you've got the price of corn, and you can see the years where we had really, really high milk prices were also the years we had really, really high corn prices. And I think there's a big shift back toward the West, just generically speaking, in terms of production economics, right? More, more grain buying, and a little bit of less favor for the Midwest in this context. And I think this is something that's still being underestimated as we go through it. Because the reason 2000, whatever, 11, 12, pick your year was fun was because corn was $7. And that was counterintuitive. Because the long run cost of milk, price of milk, is not going to be much different than the long run cost of production in the aggregate, across the United States, et cetera. And so that cost favor is shifted back to the West. I think you've beat this up today pretty good, right? Fluid sales down, we know the story. But I think. The one thing to think about this, you know, we can lament it and, it and we can talk about the plant milk and all those things, and they're all real. But the lens I look at this through is this. This morning, when we turned the lights on in this industry, we were behind by 1% of cheese demand, meaning because fluid milk sales are down the way they're down, in 2019, we've got to grow cheese demand by an incremental 1% to make up for the lost fluid sales. And so we're starting from behind. Now, can we grow cheese demand in incremental 1%? Sure. Are we going to do it at $3 a pound? Probably not, right? And so this sort of fluid sales thing is kind of a structural kind of eating away at, at the system, and I think it's, it's causing part of the problem. Let's talk about exports for a second. 
Mara talked about exports quite a bit. He talked about exports. Exports are an important topic. One of the things that the U.S. has done is we've grown those solids exports. We've done a great job of growing the exports to whatever you could say 15, 18, 20 percent, as Marin showed in his graph. But if you look at export volume, the EU has grown export. We've done nice. We've done okay. But the EU has grown export volume at a better pace than we have. Yeah, it makes sense. They've had a little bit more milk. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is the real interesting chart to me is that the weighted average unit price of those European exports are at a higher value than the U.S. value. So what does this say? What is this chart saying? We talk about value added all the time, right? We're exporting commodities. Europe is exporting value-added products or more value-added products than the U.S. And so part of the struggle with exports is not just exporting more, but it's getting to a place where you're exporting more value as a function of those exports. I mean, I don't think, I mean, yeah, it's great that we can export another, whatever, thousands of tons of skim milk powder, but it's a spectacularly unsexy product, right? I think the rest of the world is happy to let us export SMP while they export more fun stuff. And so that's, I mean, it's a good news story for the U.S., but I think we can be doing better. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more in a second. And this has been established, right? The U.S. needs to export. One of the challenges that we have with exports, in my opinion, but I think we see it every day, is that our pricing system isn't really aligned correctly to facilitate exports. If you looked at the price of cheese the past three months, U.S. cheese has been by far the cheapest cheese in the world. It is, you know, it's been, I mean, splashily like so, right? A dollar twenty barrels or less at, at times. We've had really cheap cheese. So why haven't exports been better? Now, again, there is a trade war. There is that. But the thing that people don't realize, or it's hard to get your head around, or it's not obvious, is that when, when, a, when a customer overseas says, hey, I want to buy cheese from you, Mr. or Mrs. U.S. supplier, they usually are doing it in three- or six-month increments. They're doing it for, like, periods of time, and they want a flat price for that cheese. So if they want cheese for the second quarter of 2019, they want, you know, they want one price for those three months. And the way things are structured in the U.S., if I'm a marketer or manufacturer of cheese and someone called me today and said, give me a price for April, May, June, well, what's that price? Is that price today's spot price? Or do I got to look at the futures market to quote a price for the customer? Because if I don't lock in the futures market, I could lose money on that export sale, right? So we always say, well... Uh, here, I, I could sell you uh, cheese for the second quarter. It's going to cost you $1.60, even if the spot price is $1.40 or less. Europeans don't have to deal with that. European says, yeah, say $1.50, $1.40, whatever. I'll sell you whatever number, you know. I mean, they are not in the same sort of system. But people in New Zealand can say, yeah, I'll say $1.45. Because absent a pricing structure, Co-ops, marketers in the EU, co-ops, marketers in New Zealand are not in that sort of rigid month-by-month -month pricing routine that U.S. marketers and manufacturers are. And so there's no way that a co-op is going to go quote a price for, May, June, for April, May, and June and take a flyer. They're going to say, go look at the futures market. Well, if you look at this graph, the red line is the second quarter futures price. And so while U.S. cheese, spot cheese, has been the cheapest cheese in the world by a wide margin for several months, those second quarter futures prices have been the most expensive cheese. It's just recently that we're not the most expensive cheese in the world. And the gray line is the second half futures price, $1.67. So one of the challenges we have in competing for exports is the pricing system that we're operating in to get ahead and get the sales in a very competitive environment. A couple more points about the EU. Um, EU added, has added 50 billion pounds in 10 years. So Marin's talked about this, the end of quotas, the sunset of quotas in 2015, really changed the competitive landscape globally. And if you look at average herd size, the U.S. herd size is at 234 cows today on average. In Europe, it's still at 33 cows. 
So here's kind of a gut-wrenching possibility to think about, is that we're not just looking at, we're not just waiting out our neighbor down the street. That's Peter, you know, I'm not going out of business, you're not going out of business. We're now waiting out our neighbors in Poland or in Spain or elsewhere in the world. In a truly competitively global marketplace, we're waiting out the others, right? And at 33 cows, there's a lot of consolidation that has to come in Europe if, you know, to, to kind of level up. Thank you. And so what does that, you know, how, does that happen in a high price environment or a low price environment where you drive out the inefficient European producer? So it's not just the guy next door who's got 219 cows who's below average. It's the guy in Spain with 25 that we've got to worry about as well. And Pete, this is, this is a little bit of wannabe economist graphic illustration of those green payments, right? 41 billion euros in direct payments to European farmers annually. So think about the way it's structured, right? So they have complete price, if you're a marketer, you have more or less complete price freedom. There's no regulated pricing system that, reg that dictates thou shalt pay 20 euros a hun uh, per 100 liters or whatever in a given month. Co-ops can pay whatever they want, and, you know, competitively speaking, in Europe. But part of their ability to do that and keep milk production is you got these four, the eight dollars, eight euros, or eight dollars a hundred that that Pete talked about. You have all this money coming in over the top. So you have a free market in the product arena and a heavily subsidized farm community from the tax base or whatever. It's just a decision that they have made in Europe, right? And it makes them much more competitive on exports than we are. Total pricing flexibility and pay the farmers off elsewhere. And maybe the son of NPP and his DMC program gets at that a little bit, as Mara alluded to. But this is what we're competing against, folks. So it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to be in the global marketplace. But I think that one of the things that we've done a very poor job of is understanding what the competition looks like in a post-quota era in Europe and how to fight back efficiently. Um, so just a couple of points to conclude. I am an apostate in the church of dairy policy. I'm fairly admit that. Um, I know I didn't grow up in the dairy industry, although I've been here for 20 years plus. But here's some, a couple of, as an observer, not an economist, a couple of observations. I think one of the things that we talk about all the time is innovation. Innovate, 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 right? I went to the IDFA conference last week in Florida. It was disruption. If you didn't say disruption 10 times, it was not a presentation. We say innovate but our system strangles innovation. Fixed make allowances were the poison to apple that this industry bit into in 2000, and we're paying the price today. We have, we are, we are, you cannot make money in the system we're in today. We do, we, we're in consulting projects all the time. Hey, I want to build a cheese plant. Hey, I want to do this. Hey, I want to do this. And we do the math, and we say, well, yeah, hey, guess what? For $300 million, you can build a cheese plant and make 2%. When do we start digging, right? And it's all about the system that we're in today, strangling innovation. We talk about managing risk, right? Manage risk. We got, thou shalt manage risk, dairy farmers. Get on it. And then we make it hopelessly complicated, right? And while I think that the DRP program and the son of MPP, I think they're all good programs, we're also throwing all these different things out there. It's a real big constellation of risk management. Nothing centralized. Nothing really liquid. Nothing... So, I mean, it's only useful, but it's not as good as it could be. And it's because we've not chosen to create regulation with risk management in mind, even though we talk about it all the time. And the other thing is that we want to play globally, right? Increase exports for the next 5%. But again, are we really planning for that with our regulatory structure and the way we're thinking about price and our competitors? I don't think so. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get that next 5% in any exciting way if we don't recognize what, what we're dealing with in New York and figure out how to structure a system that adequately competes. Um, I think the last thing I'll say, and I said this, you know, 10 years ago, 2009, you know, was not a good time, and you get to talk. There's a lot of the farm crisis type meetings. And I said this in Pennsylvania, I said this in Bill's home state, actually, in Pennsylvania. I said, I think that the industry has to make a decision. I think we have to decide whether we want to be Canada or New Zealand, and do one or the other. Because we're backpedaling our way one, to one corner or the other. Either we're going to be sort of strangled into Canada, where we ought to just shut it down and be small, 
Or if we really want to compete globally, just take off the chains and let, let, let the chips fall where they may. And I think we're trying to negotiate this middle ground of, oh, well, if we just get this one more formula in the system right, or we just tweak this a little bit and dial this here and dial that there, that we're just going to be fine. And we might survive. It might, not, it might be better than some of the alternatives. But I think that we really have to decide, do we want to be Canada or do we want to be New Zealand? And pick a, pick a direction and run with it. I'm not going to make a value judgment about which one is better or worse. That's for you guys to decide. But I think this middle ground we're trying to plow is really, we're not getting anywhere. Or we're, we're spinning our wheels rather than actually getting stuff done. So those are my comments for today. I'll turn it over to Sue.